tonight, the U.S. getting pulled deeper into the Middle East with tensions between U.S. ships and militant groups there spiking with concerns now of maybe a broader, bloodier war. It comes as the Israeli military is now pushing further into Gaza, giving innocent people nowhere to run in a war that shows no sign of ending. We've got more on that live from the region in a minute. Plus, back here at home, the FBI says they've arrested the source of one of the longest running spy operations ever. What we're learning about how a former ambassador allegedly got away with spying for Cuba for more than 40 years in a story that's straight out of Hollywood. Plus, in tonight's original, Purdue Pharma's fate is now in the hands of the Supreme Court as the justices weigh a bankruptcy plan. We're breaking down the potential winners, the losers, and whether any of it means justice for victims of the opioid epidemic. Then the search for survivors after a volcano exploded, killing nearly a dozen hikers. The scramble now to find dozens more people who could be stranded on that mountain. Then a story out of our American Dream series, why potential home buyers are losing hope. Is there any light at the end of this interest rate tunnel? We've got that later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie. And tonight, an American warship shooting down missiles in the Middle East with concerns now over what could set off potentially this tinderbox of a region and maybe inflame the Israel-Hamas war into something even bigger. Tonight, in just the last hour, take a look. Some new images of these flares above Gaza as Israel now expands its ground assault against Hamas to all of the Gaza Strip, with this entire region on edge. In the Red, she Red Sea, rather, you have a U.S. warship shooting down ballistic missile attacks on other ships in the area. The U.S. thinks Iran-backed rebels launched these attacks in just the last 24 hours. Then, in Iraq, the U.S. military carrying out rare self-defense strikes, according to three defense officials, killing some militants allegedly getting ready to launch a drone attack on U.S. troops. And in southern Gaza, Israeli troops pushing in, the same place Israel told thousands of innocent people to get for safety, the south. But the Red Crescent there says there's another Internet blackout in Gaza with our crew following volunteers searching through damage from an airstrike down south looking for survivors after at least 14 people were killed, according to officials there. Our Richard Engel, talking with one mother who was allowed into Israel from Gaza to give birth to triplets in Jerusalem, but she had to go back without her babies, who are still in the hospital. She and her husband don't know when they're going to see their kids again. The war separated us. As a mother, I wish I could hug my girls, Hanan says. We've got team coverage tonight with David Noriega live for us in Tel Aviv. But I want to start with Courtney Kuby at the Pentagon here because, Courtney, talk us through some of these new threats now or potential threats against U.S. troops. What are you hearing from your sources at the Pentagon? Yeah, I mean, there was it was a very active weekend in the region, and, and we're talking about some of these Iranian-backed groups. So I'll start with the one that you mentioned in your intro, and that was this self-defense strike that the U.S. military took in Iraq. Now, in this case, you remember, of course, we've been talking for weeks about this uptick in attacks against bases housing Americans in Iraq and Syria. Despite the fact that that really stopped during the pause of the ceasefire and the, and the fighting in Gaza, it has started up again, Hallie, Hallie. And yesterday, the U.S. military observed what they say were five militia fighters who were preparing to launch an attack drone at the U.S. military near Kirkuk. They took action before they were able to, able to launch it, striking it with a drone, killing the five fighters and stopping the drone. But in addition to that, yesterday, there was this hours-long attack, that uh, sustained attack by the Houthi rebels in Yemen, also Iranian-backed rebels. They fired ballistic missiles, anti-ship missiles, against at least three commercial vessels in the Red Sea. The U.S. military responding to each of those vessels' distress calls one by one. And the U.S. military, in each case, as it became the US, uh, USS Carney, U.S. warship, as it got closer to these vessels, it came in direct, the direct path of Iranian-backed Houthi rebel attack drones. The U.S. military, the USS Kearney, shooting down three of those drones. So again, Hallie, it's been an extremely volatile 24 hours or so in that region. The U.S. military really in the direct line of, the, of potential attacks here in several locations. There's also this concern, and Courtney, the reason why this matters, right, and as you've, as you've laid out here, is the concern that we've been talking about here for gosh, two months just about, the concern that this could escalate into a broader conflagration in the region. So when Israel says it's launched some new attacks in Lebanon to its north against Hezbollah, how does that fit into the picture here? 
Yeah, so, and that has been the biggest concern yeah. here. And I have to say, Hallie, just a, a little earlier this afternoon, I mean, really just about an hour ago, I spoke uh, with the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Admiral Grady, uh, and asked him all of, about this incident yesterday with the Houthis, with these continuing attacks by Iranian back groups in the region. And I said, specifically on the Houthis, the fact that they've continued to carry out these attacks throughout, even during the ceasefire in Gaza. I said, is this a sign of a potential escalation of the war outside of Gaza and Israel? And he said, it could be. It could be what he called a, a potential horizontal escalation in the region. And he said they're watching that very closely. I have to say, Ali, it's the first time I've heard a senior U.S. official say on the record that they are that this may be an indication what we're seeing uh, of the potential for this conflict to spread throughout the region. Some significant reporting there in for us late tonight. Courtney Kuby, thank you for being the tip of the spear for us at the Pentagon. We'll talk again, I know. David Noriega, let me bring you in here. You heard Courtney lay out the view from the Defense Department here, from military officials in the U.S. Give us the view from where you are. And these ground assaults now inside Gaza with Israel telling people in parts of southern Gaza to get out, even though they had told them that would be a safe location prior to this truce last week. Yeah, Hallie, so about 1.9 million people, or 80% of the population of the Gaza Strip, according to the UN, has been displaced in this war. Much of that was displacement from the north into the south. The south is now where most of the fighting is happening, especially in and around the city of Khan Yunis. It's the second largest city in the Gaza Strip. The IDF is issuing evacuation orders to many people in the south, which, again, are people who have already been evacuated or displaced in this conflict and are now being asked to do so again. Uh, the IDF says these evacuation orders are part of its larger strategy to uh, take precautions to avoid or mitigate civilian casualties. It uh, has been dropping flyers over the weekend and into today, for example, instructing people in the south South, including in and around Khan Yunis, to stay in the currently known shelters until the fighting in the area ends. Many of these are UN shelters. The UN says those shelters are overwhelmed. The UN also says that hospitals, where refugees often go and obviously wounded people go, are also completely overwhelmed, almost to the point of near inoperability. What we hear from people on the ground in Gaza is that they feel there is nowhere safe for them to go. The UN and the Red Cross agree with this assessment. And underlying all of this, I should say, is a deeper fear among Palestinians, not just in Gaza, but also elsewhere, that this steady push pushing of people southward towards the Egyptian border will eventually lead to mass displacements over that border and into Egypt, which people fear will be permanent. This is what I hear from Palestinian people all the time. I should say, Egypt itself is strenuously opposed to that happening, and so is the United States, to the point that over the weekend, Vice President Kamala Harris, after a meeting with the Egyptian president, said that the U.S. would not allow such forced relocations to happen. Hallie? There had seemed to be some momentum last week, David, as it related to that temporary humanitarian pause in fighting, that temporary ceasefire with two days extended to four, then extended to six. Obviously, that is off the table, as you have laid out. What are the chances it comes back? What are the chances that this diplomatic scramble um, actually picks up speed again? Yeah, right now the chances are dim, and they have been yeah. dim since this weekend when Israel pulled its negotiating team out of Doha, and since Hamas has been saying that it will not release any more hostages until there is a ceasefire. Uh, there are obviously ongoing diplomatic efforts by the U.S., by Qatar, by the same players that we saw in the last round, uh, but, but at this point they don't seem to be going anywhere. One group of people that that is causing tremendous anxiety for are the families of the hostages that remain in Gaza. We, we've been getting some reports, often indirect reports, not from released hostages themselves, but from their family members of the conditions that they were in. Uh, um, they were being held in, in captivity prior to the ceasefire. I want to play you a clip from um, earlier today from the uncle of uh, uh, three small children who were part of the, the groups that were released, including two twins that were three years old, talking about how they've been doing since they were released. Take a listen. Hi. Uh, sister Danielle's uh, daughter Amelia uh, is not allowing her to leave nowhere without her, nowhere, even if it's for the bathroom or just a room upstairs in, in my parents' uh, home. For those people, for those families that I've been talking to who still have loved ones in Gaza, they worry they're running out of time. They worry that their loved ones cannot survive much longer in the conditions that we're seeing uh, in videos and reports from the ground. Yeah. Hallie.
David Noriega, live for us there in Tel Aviv. Thank you. Back here at home tonight, we are looking at the weather because tons of rain is coming down over the Pacific Northwest. We're talking Seattle, Portland, with 9 million people under flood alerts and now on alert for avalanches and mudslides. It's not going anywhere either. This is going to be the reality. You see it here for people through at least the middle of this week. Over the next few days, they could see nearly a foot of rain in some spots. And the chance of 40-mile-an-hour winds is adding to concern about flooding from overflowing rivers nearby. All combined, what about mudslides? Some have already been reported in Northern California. One big highway was partially shut down. And in the mountains, there's a new avalanche risk. I want to get right to meteorologist Bill Karens. Mudslides, avalanches, what else is in store for these folks? Because there is a, so to speak, perfect storm happening. Tons of rain, melting snow runoff, rivers getting higher. It's all risky. Yeah, Hallie, this is uh, kind of what we had feared going into this winter season was, you know, these really mature, strong, powerful El Nino-ish type storms. And whenever you see on a satellite image, this is the clouds, one almost looks, looks like a cinnamon bun. That's a powerful, mature storm. And this one is huge. You know how big Alaska is. I mean, this is just a monster storm. And it's going to move northwards, and that's going to drag this slowly through the northwest. We're going to be dealing with this for about two, maybe three days. So now we have the heaviest rain in the Olympics. Olympics are right here. That's just to the west of Seattle in the Cascades. Light rain in Seattle. So right now we're okay. We had the heavy rain over the weekend. We had a little bit of a break uh, late Sunday and this morning. And now the rain's picking back up. But the rivers are already running pretty high. And with this new shot of rain coming in, plus this is a warm storm. So we're melting the snow and sending it into the rivers, almost like a spring-like scenario. That's why we have all these people that are in this flood risk, the 9 million people. We're, we're concerned about the rivers roughly in about 24 to 48 hours from now because they're already high. The heavy rain's coming in with the additional snow melt. That's when the rivers are going to peak. So let me take you through it. This is at 5 p.m., the evening rush hour in the northwest. Heaviest rain, Washington State. You're okay in Portland. Overnight, the heavy rain comes in and shifts southwards. Portland should be pouring in the morning. Anywhere on I-5, you're heading north towards Seattle. Not going to be a fun drive. Hopefully, we won't have any, like, rock slides or debris flows to have to deal with also. Then by Tuesday at 4 p.m., you get the idea how slowly this is. It's inching its way on the coast. Seattle gets a break on Wednesday, but Portland southwards you're still going to deal with it. In Northern California, it looks like Wednesday's the day you'll have to. So additional rainfall. That some areas already got five, six inches. Another eight to 11 in the Olympics. That's the reason we're very concerned with flash flooding tonight and tomorrow morning in that area. And then in the Cascades. As far as the biggest threat, this is a moderate risk for flash flooding in this little maroon area here. Everyone else is in a slight risk, including the Seattle area. And Hallie, I didn't talk a lot about snow. The ski resorts are hating us. It's gotten so warm that even above like eight to 9,000 feet, it's raining. Uh, so there's not a lot of snow to be had for in the next week from these systems. You have to be like way, way up there. So yeah, that's uh, not great for uh, winter lovers. No kidding. Bill Karens, thank you very much. To the scramble for damage control tonight now with the Intel community trying to figure out the fallout after a spy drama you are not going to believe. A secret agent allegedly infiltrating some of the highest levels of government. We're talking about a former U.S. ambassador, this guy you see here, Victor Rocha, charged today with spending 40 years working as an undercover spy for Cuba. Four decades. The attorney general today framing this as historic, one of the highest reaching and longest lasting infiltrations ever in this country. Even as Rocha was holding up big deal jobs at the State Department, he was the top diplomat to Bolivia and Argentina at one point. It was apparently just a cover for his loyalty to Fidel Castro, according to the Justice Department. In documents laying out how Rocha said the country he spent most of his life working for, the U.S., was his enemy, even bragging about his work, calling his contributions to Cuba a grand slam. Or to be accurate, more than a grand slam, he says. I want to get right to Ken Delanian, who's following this one for us tonight, along with Guad Venegas, who is live in Miami, where the first court appearance happened today. Guad, let me start for you, with you. How could this have possibly gone on this long, as the DOJ alleges, for a decade with, without this guy getting caught? Uh, Hallie, that is the question uh, by authorities here. You know, this would have started in the 80s. Uh, we saw uh, Ochoa come to court today, Victor Manuel Ochoa, who was uh, in court for a brief 15, 16 minutes. Uh, the judge read these charges, spoke about the complaint filed against them. And uh, we, of course, know about his resume. Uh, he started working for the State Department in 1981. And throughout the years, he spent time as a diplomat all across Latin America, including Mexico, the Dominican Republic, Argentina. Uh, 
Argentina. He was uh, ambassador to Bolivia. And uh, part of this time, he was also an advisor to the U.S. Southern Command, which overlooks Cuba. So one of the things that makes this very delicate is the fact that as a U.S. diplomat, as someone who advised the Southern Command, one would expect that he would have access to secret, top secret information. So if he would have been working for the Cuban government, you can imagine what that would have meant to have somebody working inside the U.S. government to, with access to this information. Now, some of the details we've been able to learn from that legal complaint filed by the government today uh, are regarding the way they were able to speak to him using an undercover agent. An FBI agent had some meeting with him, and they shared details that are so interesting, Hallie. In these details, uh, Rocha referred uh, to Fidel Castro as comandante or commander, language that you hear in a lot of communist governments. He also referred to some of his contacts in Cuba as comrades. And this, of course, all of a part of a conversation he would have had with an undercover agent, according to that legal complaint. Now, the judge that in court said that the prosecutors shared a video that is being used, we presume, as evidence. And he did ask the prosecutors to share that video with Rocha and his attorney as this case moves forward. So a lot of interesting details. One more thing, Hallie, uh, the prosecutor said that tomorrow we can expect them to file more charges so we could be learning more details as to what they are accusing him of doing during these decades. So much of this squad went down where you are in Miami. As you know, as many of our viewers know, home to a huge Cuban population, biggest Cuban, Cuban-American population in this country. Talk about the significance of that with this alleged Cuban spy essentially home basing there. Right, so we actually had a conversation with U.S. Congressman uh, Carlos Jimenez here um, in uh, Miami. And one of the things we discuss is what this will mean for U.S.-Cuba relationships moving forward. Uh, of course, many of those in Miami, Cuban-Americans who are against the Castro regime, will be asking the U.S. government to perhaps take action, impose some type of sanction against the Cuban government. But all in all, it means what many Cuban-Americans suspect, that the Cuban government continues to attempt to interfere with the U.S. government. And it's going to be interesting to see how the Biden administration will react. Of course, there's a case that needs to move forward against this agent, but with the government accusing him of being a spy for 40 years, it's interesting to see if the Biden administration will take any kind of action and also to see what kind of reaction might come from the Cuban government, Hallie. Squad Venegas live for us there in Miami with so many more threads to pull on, so many more pieces to this puzzle. Thank you. Let me get to Ken with more on this damage assessment, the fallout here, because it feels like one key question is how much... Did Victor Rocha tell Cuba about U.S. secrets? That is the most important question, Hallie, and there's nothing to be learned about that in the FBI criminal complaint that was released today. And it's not clear whether that's because they don't know or because they're waiting to present this evidence. Um, look, if he, he was a, a, a covert agent for Cuba's intelligence service, according to this complaint, for 40 years, and during that time, he had very senior posts in the government, including as the U.S. ambassador to Bolivia. The ambassador gets a lot of very sensitive information, including the identities of the CIA officers in that country and details about CIA operations, perhaps in that country and elsewhere in Latin America. He also worked at the National Security Council in the White House, where he had access to very sensitive secrets. So the biggest question that the FBI has and the government has is what did he give the Cubans? Do they need to do this damage assessment? The State Department said today that that damage assessment is ongoing. Uh, but one way to short circuit that would be if he would cooperate and he would tell them. And one former FBI official said to me uh, today that it's more important that he tells them what he gave than whether he serves 10 or 20 years in prison. So they may be ready to offer him a deal if he would cooperate, Hallie. I guess I think... Uh let me, let me try to channel what I think people might be wondering here, which is, well, wait a second. Aren't there checks to go in place mm -hmm. to see if people are spies? Aren't people asked things like, are you a spy? And you're supposed to say no. Like, are, are there not guardrails in place to prevent this kind of thing from happening, particularly yes. for happening for 40 years? There absolutely are, and he circumvented them, and good spies do that. Remember Robert Hansen, who was in the middle of the FBI feeding secrets to the Soviet Union for years, or Aldrich Ames at the CIA doing the same thing. 
in this case, he, you know, he would have been polygraphed with, as, a, as a person with a high-level security clearance. There are supposed to be background investigations. Look, we all know that the U.S. government is not as efficient at these kinds of things as we would like to see, but there are checks and balances in place. But he said in this complaint, when he thought he was talking to his Cuban handler, he talked about the tradecraft that he used. He ran a surveillance detection route before each meeting, which means taking evasive action to make sure he wasn't Followed. So he had some spy craft training and he was able to very quietly live for 40 years, according to this complaint, as an undercover covert agent without being detected, despite having all these high level government jobs, Sally. Ken Delaney, and just a wild story. So many questions there. Thanks for being on top of it, along with our colleague Guad Venegas there in Florida. Out west now, any moment, a suspected serial killer is due in LA court to potentially face charges in the death of three men facing homelessness. Remember, we brought you the breaking news right here on Friday that police were asking people not to sleep alone outside as they looked for the killer. Well, now they've connected 33-year-old Jared Joseph Powell to those three killings and to the murder of a fourth person, all within four days throughout L.A. County last week. You see the locations here. Dana Griffin is covering all of these developments for us tonight. Dana, bring us up to speed on what we're learning today about these deaths and about this case. Yeah, so Hallie, I can take you back to last week when these all started. On a Sunday, the first homeless man who was sleeping on a couch in an alleyway was shot and killed. The next day, Monday, a second homeless person was shot and killed. Now, the third victim was an L.A. County employee who was followed home allegedly by the suspect from an electric vehicle charging station to his home where police say he robbed and killed the victim. By Wednesday, we had the fourth man killed, another homeless man who was killed while sleeping on a sidewalk. Investigators alerted the unhoused population, warning them to not sleep outside alone and to seek shelter. And Friday, they didn't realize at the time that they had already had the suspect in custody. He was arrested Thursday because his vehicle went into Beverly Hills where his license plate pinged an automated license plate reader and investigators were immediately able to arrest him. They say Initially, he did not comply with their commands, but they did get him in custody, and they say they found the murder weapon inside his vehicle, Hallie. Talk about some of this technology here, the, the license plate reader tech. Why is it so controversial? Pull on that thread. Yeah. Yeah, so some civil liberties groups oppose it because they cite concerns over privacy and fear that the technology could be abused and maybe used for political spying. In Beverly Hills, the police chief tells me that this is not what they're doing with their cameras. They've got about 50 and plan to add 40 more. And he explained a little bit more about how the technology works, that a suspect's vehicle has to be entered into the system. They're not just, you know, capturing everyone's license plate license numbers as they cross through cameras. He says it actually has helped, you know, to bring the community together in a sense. It's helped them build trust within the community. Here's why. I think what the technology does, instead of stopping a lot of vehicles that might have someone that matches the description, what it does is allow us to stop the right person in the right vehicle. And uh, again, I call that precision policing. And here in Beverly Hills, they say when that video is recorded as cars pass by, once it's ping, pinged, they say they keep that video for only 13 months, which is another concern from these privacy groups. Hallie. Dana Griffin live for us there in Los Angeles. Dana, thanks for being on top of that one for us. Back here to Washington now in the Supreme Court with justices seeming split tonight over a controversial settlement that puts billions of dollars on the line for victims of the opioid crisis. You're seeing some protesters there outside court chanting, strike down the deal. They're calling on that deal to be struck down between Purdue Pharma and its owners, the Sackler family, made with victims of the opioid crisis. It's a settlement that the Biden administration is now arguing against, since it lets the Sacklers avoid any future lawsuits related to this epidemic. And that brings us to tonight's original, because for some victims, this moment marks the most high-profile and highly charged fight yet in a battle for accountability. For Ellen Isaacs... He was a remarkable young man. The grief still raw after her son, Ryan, overdosed and died in her home in 2018 after struggling 17 years with addiction. I hear this huge bang on the bathroom 
wall and I finally got it unlocked and he was there on the floor blue and foaming at the mouth. Isaac says Ryan got hooked on opioids after doctors prescribed him painkillers for a back injury. It's why she joined a lawsuit against Purdue Pharma, formerly owned by the Sackler family. But the terms of the settlement mean she wouldn't be able to sue on her own down the road. No one would, since the settlement releases the Sacklers from future liability. The Sacklers are just doing whatever they want to do, and we're stuck left and holding the bag. It's every mother's nightmare. And so for Purdue to come in and structure a way to uh, uh, their owners to escape liability is just wrong. That's all she's asking for, to, to, to go before a jury of her peers and have a trial. Attorney Mike Quinn. This is not over. In court so. today, after giving up corporate cases to devote more time fighting for victims of the opioid crisis, an epidemic estimated to have killed more than 600,000 Americans. This bankruptcy system was not set up for people to absolve themselves of wrongdoing and, and really bad activities. Under the Sackler family, Purdue manufactured OxyContin, the highly addictive opioid. The company's already pleaded guilty to multiple crimes related to misleading the public about the drug's potential for abuse. Hospitals, states, and individuals brought thousands of cases against Purdue, which this settlement, now on hold, would resolve. Its terms mean the Sacklers would be paying billions of dollars to victims and others in return for the release of liability. To some, it is enough. Lawyers for one group representing multiple plaintiffs writing in a brief, while their clients have no love lost for the Sacklers, they recognize the settlement is the only means of getting billions of dollars in life-changing and life-saving funds that are desperately needed today. Reps for the Sacklers did not respond to our request for comment, but lawyers for Purdue in court argued this money matters. Creditors and victims will be left with nothing and lives literally will be lost. Nothing in the code commands that tragic result. I want to bring in now one of our Supreme Court correspondents, Lawrence Hurley, who is joining us here. You spent the morning, I know, at the Supreme Court following these arguments here that we've just laid out. It seems like if you're reading the tea leaves, the justices seemed pretty split with some questions over why they should blow up this deal. Since, as we noted, there are some plaintiffs who are in favor of they want the money. That's what Purdue's arguing. On the other hand, there's concern here that this releases the Sacklers of any other accountability down the road. So help us understand the arguments and where you think this may go. I'm not asking you to make predictions, but just the sense from your sort of expert knowledge of tea leaves here. It's a tough one for the justices because I think there's a sort of dry legal argument that's about, you know, what the power of bankruptcy judges and whether they can approve settlements that involve people who aren't directly involved in the bankruptcy, which is in this case is the Sacklers. Uh, and there, you know, the court, some of the justices at least seem pretty sympathetic to that argument. Mm. But then you have this bigger question of like, well, you're going to blow up this big settlement. The, most of the plaintiffs support it. It's a lot of money and they might not be able to get the money in any other way. And uh, some of that, those comments were sort of encapsulated by Justice Elena Kagan, who had some comments on both sides, which I think we can listen into now. It's overwhelming, the support for this deal, and among people who have no love for the Sacklers, among people who think that the Sacklers are pretty much the worst people on earth. In some ways, they're getting a, a better deal than the usual bankruptcy discharge because, as Justice Gorsuch uh, indicated, they're being protected from claims of fraud and claims of willful misconduct. And so, uh, yeah, what we can see there is that Justice Kagan... You know, on the one hand, she's saying, well, they're getting a sweet deal here. But on the other hand, she's saying, well, we need to protect this settlement to help the people who are suffering from the opioid epidemic. Does this seem like a case? And again, just so people are understand, we're not going to know which way the justices will go until probably the end of the term here, at least close to the end of the term in spring or early summer. Does this seem like a case that may split down sort of tr quote unquote, traditional party lines for these justices? No, I don't think so. I mean, the argument today suggested that, you know, they're, they're all kind of grappling with this. Yeah. You know, it wasn't really clear, like, if anyone was super one way or the other. Mm. It's more like they're all kind of weighing both sides. You know, but I, some of them, you know, Justice Neil Gorsuch seemed very uh, supportive of the government position, but other people not so much. The stakes are huge here, Lawrence. Yeah, there's a lot of money at stake. That was a point made by Pratik Shah, who's one of the lawyers uh, for the victims. Uh, and we, we can hear a little bit of what he's had to say. Let me be crystal clear. Without the release, the plan will unravel, Chapter 7 liquidation will follow, and there will be no viable path to any victim recovery. And so what we can see from that is that, you know, if this settlement doesn't get approved, 
the victims think they might not get anything. Yeah, uh, we will see how this one plays out. Lawrence Hurley, thank you very much uh, with a very high profile day at the Supreme Court. Appreciate it. We've got a lot more coming up here on the show, too, including some new reporting showing that hack against 23andMe affected way more people than initially thought, like millions more people. We've got more on that in a second. Neck guards now set to be mandatory in certain ice hockey games after the death of Adam Johnson. We've got that coming up in our five things. But first, we're just learning tonight that the hack on that genetic testing company, 23andMe, was way worse than initially thought. Originally, the company said hackers got access to about 14,000 users and their data. Turns out it's more like nearly 7 million people, according to a spokesperson. That's about half of their user base. I want to bring in cybersecurity reporter Kevin Collier. Kevin, what happened here, right? Like, the number explode. 14,000 is not even a little bit close to 7 million people. Talk to us about how this happened and the data that's at risk here. This is people's most personal info. It is. So it's it's two factors here that, that, that is how they, they got this. Uh, step one, you know how we're not supposed to not reuse the same username and password across multiple sites. This is exactly why. Most users were not hacked. A couple were. Hackers got a list of usernames and passwords, a giant list from previous sites, and just spammed 23andMe until they got into a couple thousand users' accounts. And then from there, it's kind of 23andMe by design. They have a, something like a social media network. You know, the, the whole point is you're supposed to meet other people who have similar genetic match, maybe you're related. Uh, and so with that information, they're able to look at other users. You might have a hop or two away. So you, you can see their uh, kind of ethnic background. You can see specific DNA information. You can see their name, zip code, really, really personal stuff. It's kind of built into how 23andMe operates. So what's the company saying tonight? How are they going to rectify this? And what do people who use it need to do? Because I remember the time, I mean, like, people used to get that for Christmas presents, for family members, right? For holiday, it was like a huge thing. Everybody was like, oh, I wonder what, you know, what is this is all about. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things where it's, it's, it's fundamental to the company. Like, biometric information yeah. is, it can be a really handy thing. You can learn these, all this information about people you might be related to. It can be really... It can be great for security, too. But biometric, kind of by definition, with very rare exceptions, you can't change it. So if you give that information to somebody and they don't have take a lot of custody over it, it gets leaked, you don't get it back. That doesn't change. It's built into your body kind of forever. So it might make some people think twice about sharing that kind of information. When we come back, a lot more to get to, including in Indonesia, a, a very intense race against time. How teams are trying to rescue dozens of people now stranded after an eruption. Plus, Marvel actor Jonathan Major's assault trial starting in New York today. But his lawyers say prosecutors are targeting him. To Indonesia now, where a huge volcano has erupted for the second time in just the last few days, setting off a scramble to find survivors. 11 people have been killed. A dozen more are still missing as rescuers are looking for anybody left alive on the mountain. It is still spilling ash on the villages below. Dangerous and risky. NBC's Josh Letterman has more. A huge volcanic eruption in Indonesia stranded dozens of mountain climbers, and local officials say it killed at least 11 people. The sound of prayer as the search continues for 12 more missing people, according to officials. Efforts halted this morning when the mountain erupted again. But amid the smoke and ash, perhaps there's also hope. Three survivors brought down from the mountain today. One man reaching out for help from high altitude. Uh, he had sent a video of his condition and said that he was trapped. After that, around 6 p.m., he called and he said that he was very thirsty. He could not walk anymore. The agonizing wait continues for this woman, hoping for news about her nephew as rescue efforts resume. He left for the hike on Saturday. It looks like he was on his way down and got stuck until now, and we don't know his whereabouts. Mount Merapi is one of the country's many active volcanoes, located on the island of Sumatra. It's one of more than 120 active volcanoes in Indonesia, which sees so many because it's part of the Pacific's Ring of Fire, where shifting tectonic plates often trigger eruptions and earthquakes. The peak of Merapi has been close to climbing since 2011, but that hasn't stopped some from breaking the rules. When the volcano exploded in a plume of ash and smoke on Sunday, responders couldn't rescue everyone. They found 11 bodies this morning, but could only recover three before it erupted again. A local official saying they 
fear more eruptions. Around the base of the volcano, several villages woke up under a thick blanket of ash and volcanic debris, unsure if tomorrow will bring more survivors or more eruptions. Josh Letterman, NBC News. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of New York, the criminal trial for Jonathan Majors began today with competing versions of what happened in a violent confrontation in the back of a car, one that led to the Marvel actor being charged with assault last spring. Majors' attorneys say his ex-girlfriend was the aggressor and that prosecutors are targeting him because he's black. Majors pleaded not guilty, but he could end up with a year behind bars if he's convicted. Out of our Southern Bureau, remember that hiker who got lost for more than a week before her rescue at Big Bend National Park? An incredible rescue after days lost in the wilderness. Well, look, she's now TikToking about it, posting a whole bunch of pictures from when she was missing. You can see the conditions getting worse and worse, honestly, scarier and scarier. The soundtrack song to this TikTok, by the way, was Soldier Boy, Turn My Swag On. She captioned the post, but seriously, I'm so grateful, she says, to be alive and healthy. And out of our Western Bureau, check it out, Darius Rucker. Hootie and the Blowfish getting his Hollywood Walk of Fame start today. I know you remember Hootie, the soundtrack to the mid-90s, the earworm of 94 and 95. Rucker says in his speech that this kind of thing is the stuff you don't even dream about. Coming up, Spotify tonight. Hey, it's laying off a bunch of its workers, and the timing of the whole announcement is pretty interesting. We're getting into why next. Tonight, new details after Spotify says it's slashing 17% of the people who work for it. They're laying off 1,500 people in what is the third round of cuts this year. The CEO, in a new email to staff, says Spotify took on too many employees. They overloaded in 2020 and 2021, right around the time it was making some big podcast deals with Joe Rogan, Meghan Markle, the Call Her Daddy podcast, which you probably listen to, a lot of people do. It's all coming right as we all got over our Spotify wrapped. Probably the biggest and most successful brand campaign that Spotify has. It's whole breakdown of what we all listened to in the last year. I want to bring in Jake Ward here. Um, a lot of people obviously use and listen to Spotify. We did a whole segment on the show the other week about what the wrapped meant for the industry and for the company generally. Are these layoffs enough to get them back on track financially? Considering if you look at Wall Street, they seem to like it. Well, that's right. I mean, the 30,000 foot view here, right, is, of course, the upending of the music industry, Hallie, right, where you've got artists making as little as they've ever made on recorded music, having to depend on touring to get around. And that's, of course, because of companies like Spotify. They come from this long tradition of pirated music, the BitTorrent world, right? All of that is where Daniel Ek, the CEO, comes from. It was sort of the business model of Spotify. So there's all of that. Uh, there are also some very specific things. So in spite of the user growth over time, which Spotify has enjoyed, I mean, in 2022, you had 456 million people using it. Uh, l this year, it's gone up again, 574 million. You know, it's got 118 million more users now than it did last year. That's a big deal. But the problem is the margins on that business are incredibly low. A acquiring the license in order to legally stream this music is very, very expensive, which is part of why they don't want to pay artists very much. And it's why, you know, their their profits are so low. They've only just turned a profit this last quarter in a sort of surprise move. Mm. And here's the other big one is that they owe about a billion and a half dollars on a piece of debt that's coming due in 2026. And Daniel Ek points at the rising interest rates on servicing that debt. They've got a big, big mortgage to pay. And this seems to be a move to try and get out in front of that kind of debt, Hallie. As you take that 30,000 foot view, though, right, talk through the way that we're seeing some of these tech companies making moves, um, trimming, trimming costs when they can, labor costs, using AI when they can. Um, what does that say about sort of the, the bigger moment that we're in here? Well, I think, you know, any company you have out there that builds its business proposition on technology is going to be trying to trim labor at some point. You know, one of the places that I always come back to when I think about this is Uber. If you look at their yearly filings that they have to put through with the Securities and Exchange Commission, where they have to tell you what some of the risks are, are for investing in Uber, they talk, for instance, about the push to wanting to replace human drivers 
with autonomous vehicles. And they say in the filing itself that they want to do that. You know, the, the idea that we're going to use autonomous vehicles to substantially reduce our costs, that's true at Uber. And trying to do that kind of thing at Spotify or any other tech company is what's coming. And so over and over again, especially as times gets tight, they're going to cut people first. And that seems to be the move here, Hallie. Jake Ward, thank you very much for that breakdown. A lot more to come here on the show. You know that buying a house feels pretty impossible to a lot of people right now? So what has to happen for that to change? We've got a look in our ongoing American Dream series. Come out. So you know tonight that millions of Americans, maybe even you, are facing this dilemma. When, if ever, you're going to be able to buy a house? Because owning the home, to a lot of folks, is one of the main pillars of what we think of. We think about the American dream, but for so many people, it is simply not affordable these days. The average price of a home still sitting at more than $430,000. So renters are having a tough time jumping in. Even some who already own a house are feeling stuck with today's high mortgage rates. It's leading to an ice-cold market with pending transactions, meaning sales to come at the lowest they've been in 20 years. Christine Romans has more in our American Dream series. The housing market is frozen and expensive. Want to buy a house? You'll probably need to be making six figures. And that's just not something a lot of people in the U.S. have. It's hard even for those checking what would normally be the right boxes. An experienced 29-year-old Dylan Rose knows right. well. There is uh, no way that we came even close to being able to afford a house despite us having good jobs, a combined $200,000 income. Recently married, he and his wife planned to buy a home in Beacon, New York, a few hours from New York City, only to be priced out. Within just five minutes of, of going on websites like Zillow, it just wasn't feasible at all. Recent data from the National Association of Realtors showing the salary of a typical home buyer is $107,000, up 22% from last year. But the thing is, the median income for families is only about 75000 So what's making buying a house so out of reach for a lot of people? One big thing, high mortgage rates. Remember, for the last year and a half, the Federal Reserve has been raising interest rates to fight inflation by slowing down the economy. And for some people, that's exactly what's happening. Those rising rates can add hundreds of dollars more to monthly mortgage payments, putting home ownership out of reach for a lot of people. For a starter home, a minimum of about $4,000 a month plus the, the uh, down payment, close to $100,000 just for that. Today, the median American household needs almost half of its income to cover the cost of owning a home. That's the highest ever on record going back to 2006. And when you take a closer look at who ends up being able to do the buying in this market, it's older buyers. Repeat buyers, who may be boomers, are the ones who are winning out on today's housing market. They have the money, and they're often sitting in homes already with mortgages paid off. The vast majority of younger homeowners with mortgages have interest rates well below 5%, which can make it hard to move. That leads to fewer homes on the market, keeping prices high. Existing home sales last month at a 13-year low. It all means that today, first-time buyers make up only 32% of the market, historically low, and they're more likely to be in their mid-30s rather than their late 20s like they were a few decades ago. They're substantially wealthier. And we also saw that this year's first-time home buyers are more likely to rely on financial assets. So 401k, stock, cryptocurrency for their down payment. And that's not something that every American has. A sobering reality for Dylan and his partner trying to build a foundation for the future. Unless you have generational wealth, it's very, very challenging right now. Christine Romans is joining us now. It is so interesting, Christine. If you are not a boomer, if you're yeah. a millennial, if you're Gen Z, is the only solve crossing your fingers and hoping that mortgage rates go down? <laughs> And you're hoping that, you know, time will heal all these wounds and eventually sometime next year things will get back to normal. But we're really far from normal. You've got high prices. You've got these high mortgage rates at 8 percent. Consider that 80 percent of people in a home right now, their mortgage is below 5 percent. So that 5 percent, 8 percent, that's a big difference. And low inventory. I mean, look how low, Hallie. 3.6 month supply. Mm. That is way uh, lower than normal. You usually have to have about a half a year to be considered balanced.
What about people who are stuck renting right now? Is that really the worst thing? It seems like there might be some benefits to it. Well, I'm glad that you said that because for the first time in maybe a generation, it makes more sense to rent than to buy when you look at mm. how the budgets all come wow. out. So it might mean you just have to sit tight here and save your money. At some point, these boomers are not going to stay in these big houses that they have paid off forever. <laughs> they're going to downsize. They're going to move. And at some point, interest rates will start to drift lower again. The inflation story may be under control here, which means next year will be a year of maybe slightly declining interest rates. And so perhaps uh, things will get a little bit more normal. But I will say, when you look at the post-World War II history, 8% mortgage rates aren't really that unusual. But we had spent, what, 10 years at 0% uh, interest. So this is still the hangover from, from really cheap money for too long in this country. Christine Romans with our American Dream <laughs> series. Great to have you. Thank you nice so much. Nice to see you. You too. That does it for us for this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now. Tonight, the U.S. getting pulled deeper into the Middle East with tensions between U.S. ships and militant groups in that region now spiking with concerns of a broader, bloodier war. It comes as the Israeli military is pushing further into Gaza, giving civilians nowhere to run in a conflict that shows no sign of ending. We're live in the region with more on this war. Plus, in tonight's original, Purdue Pharma's fate is now in the hands of the Supreme Court as the justices weigh a controversial settlement. We're breaking down if any of it could mean justice or accountability for victims of the opioid epidemic. Then in the Pacific Northwest, it is looking wet and maybe dangerous for millions of people. More on the threat of mudslides, even avalanches in a minute. And out west in L.A., a suspected serial killer now in custody in court tonight. And in the last few minutes, we're seeing the charges against him with new details on how police used some controversial technology to stop a man they say was on a killing spree. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and tonight you've got a U.S. warship shooting down missiles in the Middle East with concerns over whether this could set off a tinderbox in a region that is potentially uh, at the verge of it and inflame the Israel-Hamas war into something even bigger. Tonight, in just the last 90 minutes, two hours or so, we're getting some new images of these flares, some fires around Gaza, with Israel now expanding its ground assault against Hamas to all of the Gaza Strip, the region. On edge, in the Red Sea, you've got an American ship shooting down ballistic missile attacks on other ships in the area. With a senior U.S. official telling our team late today, some of this new tension could be a signal of escalation in the region, even outside of Gaza and Israel. The U.S. believes that Iranian-backed rebels launched these attacks in just the last day. Then in Iraq, you have the military, the American military, carrying out some rare self-defense strikes, according to three defense officials, killing some militants allegedly preparing to launch a drone attack on U.S. troops. And in southern Gaza, you have Israeli troops pushing in. Remember, the south, southern Gaza, this is the same place that Israel initially told hundreds of thousands of innocent people to go to for safety as Israel retaliated against that October 7th terror attack by Hamas. In Gaza, the Red Crescent says there's another internet blackout as our crew follows volunteers searching through damage from an airstrike in the south, looking for any survivors after they say at least 14 people were killed, according to officials. Our Richard Engel, talking with one mother who was allowed into Israel from Gaza to give birth to triplets in Jerusalem, but she had to go back without her babies who are still in a hospital. This is Richard FaceTiming her and her husband as he is with their babies. They don't know when they're going to see their kids again. The war separated us as a mother. I wish I could hug my girls, Hanan says. We've got team coverage tonight with David Noriega live for us, Halagarani, I should say, live for us in Tel Aviv. But I want to start with Courtney Kuby, who is live at the Pentagon. And Court, talk to me about some of this new reporting that you have, some new concern. It seems for the first time on the record from people that you're talking to about the concern that this work could spread. That has been a risk since the very beginning here, really October 8th, right? And now here yeah. we are almost two months later, uh, and, the, and the fear is that it could become the reality. Yeah, a risk and really a primary concern here at the Pentagon is this, this idea that w the, the war in Israel and Gaza could spread to the region, pulling other nations like the United States in. Uh, what we heard this afternoon from Admiral Grady, the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, I spoke with him at the Atlantic Council for an event, and I asked him if, in fact, these attacks by the Houthis, which have been continuing and really only escalating uh, in the last several weeks, whether it's, it could be an indication that this conflict in Israel and Gaza is escalating to the region. And he said it could be and that they need to watch it very closely. So that's the furthest that 
We've had a U.S. official or a defense official here at the Pentagon say about the concerns about escalation really beginning, potentially beginning, beginning to manifest. And what he's talking about is, of course, these attacks by the Houthi rebels yesterday. It was this a sustained campaign by the, the Houthis, um, attacks against the maritime or commercial ships in the Red Sea, firing ballistic missiles, striking three different commercial ships. The USS Kearney, a U.S. Navy warship, was in the region at the time and responded to the distress calls and itself was nearby as Houthi drones came came in, not targeting the Kearney necessarily, but coming within a, a close enough distance on a correct trajectory that the U.S. Navy shot those drones down as self-defense. But this, again, is just the, another incident in what has been a string of incidents, Houthi rebels firing missiles, drones at ships in the Red Sea, and even trying to strike southern Israel, Hallie. Talk about, to that end, this new tension now between the U.S. and the Houthis, the Iranian-backed rebels. They're that militant group here. What we know about it, what we don't know about it, um, we're showing folks here a map of the region because, as you say and as you point out, this is such a regional issue here. Yes. So the Houthis have, uh, they, they have been funded, trained, backed by Iran for years now. And they have been fighting their own, uh, the Saudi Arabia has, has been at, at, at war with them for years. There's been this ceasefire that's existed now for more than a year. Um, but it was, it was somewhat, somewhat tenuous in nature. It wasn't considered necessarily a lasting ceasefire. But the Houthis had quieted down over the last year or so. They had not been trying to attack inside Saudi Arabia. The Saudi airstrikes had stopped. This has all restarted again since October 7th, the attacks. Now, the question here is, is Iran directing the Houthis to carry out these sorts of attacks? We know that they fund them and they support them, but are they actually directing them? The language has hardened by U.S. officials on this, them saying that they are enabling. Uh, the U.S. officials, including Jake Sullivan today, the Pentagon Deputy Press Secretary, saying that, in fact, Iran is enabling the Houthi rebels. And what's interesting here, Hallie, is during this pause or ceasefire in Gaza that, that lasted for about a week, other Iranian-backed militias like Kataib Hezbollah and Lebanese Hezbollah, they really stopped their activity and these strikes that they had and attacks that they had been carrying out. The Houthis did not. They continued. So the question is, how much is Iran really directing their activity or are they using this opportunity to carry out these sorts of attacks and really have the world be on the world stage? Everyone in the world is paying attention to when they go after these these ships in the in the Red Sea. They may just be trying to get some attention here. Uh, and, and we don't really have an answer to that. What is clear, according to U.S. officials, is no matter what goes on with these proxy groups, they say that Iran, the, as the intelligence assessment continues to be that Iran does not want a larger war with the U.S. and with the West, Hallie. Courtney QB with a lot going on tonight at the Pentagon. Courtney, thank you for keeping us up to speed with the latest reporting. Hala Garani, I want to get to you live in the region now. Give us a sense, as Courtney has given us a sense of the military perspective, of what's happening inside Gaza right now, what it says about the plans that Israel has for its next phase of this military push. Well, many of our viewers will know that the initial uh, Israeli military operation focused on the north of the Gaza Strip, which is a very small, narrow strip of land, and that uh, they are now expanding their ground operations into the south. They are dropping leaflets. They have also put together this grid pattern over the Gaza Strip and tiny little parcels of land, each given a number, and they are encouraging people in the southern part of Gaza to to um, use QR codes to determine where they should evacuate to. So many people from the north have gone to Khan Yunus, for instance, in the south, to refugee camps in the south as well. And they are saying that uh, once displaced, they're being again asked to leave. And many of them are telling us they don't know where to go or where feels safe. Uh, we have some NBC News video of displaced Gaza residents who've said that now they, they really don't know where to turn. Listen to this. They threw leaflets at us, and we came out from under the rubble. They told us to go into a safe area, Khan Yunus. We went to Khan Yunus. We stayed at Khan Yunus for 10 days, and after 10 days, they threw leaflets at us. We don't know where to run. 
And you can imagine that these are people with families. These are people with some of the medical needs. There is no water. There is no way to, uh, you know, essentially take care of children, bathe them. You're having starting to have skin conditions, um, uh, intestinal issues as well in this overly crowded uh, half of the Gaza Strip, just as the Israeli military continues its offensive. And I should note that there is a communication blackout, at least according to the Palestinian Red Crescent. They are saying that they're not able to get in touch with their teams this evening inside the Gaza Strip. So that obviously complicates uh, the, the task of, of, of people who are trying to figure yeah. out with their phones where they can evacuate to and be safe from this Israeli operation. Yeah, it is uh, just a, a difficult scene there. Hala Garani, thank you very much. Live for us mm -hmm. there from Tel Aviv. We appreciate your time and your reporting tonight. Back here in the U.S., it is a scramble for damage control as the intel community is trying to figure out the fallout after a spy drama you are not going to believe. It sounds like something legit out of Hollywood here. A secret agent allegedly infiltrating some of the highest levels of government. A former U.S. ambassador, the guy you see here, Victor Rocha, charged today with spending 40 years working as an undercover spy for the government of Cuba. The attorney general is basically saying this is historic. He says it's one of the highest reaching and longest lasting infiltrations ever in this country. Even as Rocha was holding down these big deal jobs at the State Department, he was the top diplomat to Bolivia and Argentina at one point, it was allegedly just a cover for his loyalty to Fidel Castro, according to the Justice Department. And documents laying out how Rocha said the country he spent most of his life working for, the U.S., was his enemy, bragging about his work, calling his contributions to Cuba more than a grand slam. I want to get to our team covering this. When NBC's Guad Venegas is following this from Miami, where Rocha was in court for the first time today, our justice and intelligence correspondent Ken Delaney and is here as well with the big picture. Ken, stand by, because Guad, I want to get to you first. The picture here, right, the illustration that is revealed from some of these documents filed today is just dramatic here. Somebody who is pledging his allegiance to Cuba, even as he was finding out some of the most important secrets related to the U.S. government as his role as a top diplomat. Hallie, and as someone that worked uh, for the U.S. government, he would have had access to a lot of information, especially at some point being the ambassador to Bolivia, which, by the way, there's connections there, because at the time when he was in Bolivia, this was the time when Evo Morales was coming up running for president. Evo Morales, who's known to be one of Fidel Castro's protégés in Latin America. He was the socialist president that eventually became president in Bolivia. And now there's talks of whether uh, Rocha could have been involved in what happened in Bolivia when Evo Morales also came to power. So you look at his, uh, his resume. Starting in the 80s, he began working for the State Department. After that, he worked all across Latin America, including Mexico, Argentina, the Dominican Republic, and of course, even before that, he had spent some time, and after that, spent some time working in Cuba as well. So the information we've received from prosecutors in this legal complaint also has details of a conversation that an undercover FBI agent had with Rocha. This is after the FBI FBI was alerted that he was a spy. In that conversation, Rocha referred to Fidel Castro as comandante or commander, and he also referred to his contacts in Cuba as comrades, terms that we usually see in movies that we associate with communist governments, Hallie. So fascinating details yeah. that we're learning. There's also the, the regional impact here, right? Because as you know, in South Florida, there's a lot of Cuba, biggest Cuban, Cuban American population in the country. A lot of Cubans came to that area to get away from a government they feared. I wonder if you can speak to how this news is landing in this community, this very particular sense of place. Hallie, one of the best people to speak to about this is uh, U.S. Congressman Carlos Jimenez, who was born in Cuba but is American. He's now a U.S. Congressman. Uh, he spoke to us earlier today about what this means for U.S.-Cuba relationships. Now, in Cuba, or in the U.S., that is, you have a lot of Cuban-Americans that oppose the Castro regime that for years uh, have, of course, been waiting for a change in Cuba for many of them to visit Cuba or to have some type of relationship with people that they have in Cuba or, or just for them, they have essentially want to see the U.S. break ties with Cuba until there's a change of regime. So what Jimenez told us today is that the Biden administration should react to this and impose some type of sanction. And of course, this also uh, tells us, or, you know, for some of the people, it tells them that Cuba might still continue to want to interfere with the United States government. So again, fascinating details as we learn more. One last thing, uh, Hallie, we expect prosecutors to present more charges with new information tomorrow in court about Rocha.
We will see. Uh, Guadalajas, thank you. Ken, let's go to you because the new information that Guad is referring to here could be fascinating because it feels like as this scramble to assess the damage here happens, the key question, was he able to pass on secrets to Cuba? Will we ever know the answer? Uh, I believe we will, Hallie. Certainly the U.S. government is trying to find the answer right now. They may already know part of the answer. And Guad referred to additional charges. That very well could be uh, charges of passing classified information, defense information, because this current uh, set of charges uh, does not include that allegation. There's no allegation that he passed classified information uh, to the Cubans, but it's hard to imagine that he would have not done that. I mean, that's the whole purpose for being a covert agent buried inside the U.S. government uh, with a high-level security clearance. And so that is the really the most important question that the U.S. government needs to answer. And they would likely, uh, you know, almost be prepared to cut a deal with him to be more lenient in the prosecution if he would come clean and, and acknowledge, and of course he'd be polygraphed throughout that process and debriefed uh, exactly what he gave the Cuban government. But according to this criminal complaint, he is a loyal, committed convert to the Cuban revolution. He's an ideological spy. So it's yeah. not clear that he will want to cooperate, Hallie. As you're alluding to here, there are systems in place to prevent this kind of thing from happening, for somebody to rise to this level of power in the diplomatic corps w w while acting essentially as an undercover agent. Do you get the sense, based on your many years of covering the intelligence community, covering national security, that this is an instance of Victor Rocha being some espionage genius, or did he just exploit a system that has some flaws? Can we, can we, do we know, can we tell? I think it's probably a little bit of both. I, look, spies happen, and you know there have been some hmm. notorious cases, incredible cases of people buried inside the FBI and the CIA at the highest levels who turned over information that got people killed. Uh, and, and look, the Cuba has punched above its weight in terms of developing spies in the United Good States. Point. Famously, Ana Montes was a defense intelligence agency official um, who, who spied for Cuba, just released from prison recently. So look, but nonetheless, this is a devastating penetration. Clearly, the U.S. government does not want something like this to be able to happen. This man was there for 40 years undetected. Somebody screwed up, obviously, here, Hallie. Ken Delaney, and we'll find out more potentially in the days to come. Thanks for being on top of it. Appreciate it. Take you out west now, where there is tons of rain coming down over the Pacific Northwest, potentially dangerous rain in Seattle, Portland, nine million people under flood alerts and on alert for avalanches and mudslides. Look at this. It's the reality for people there that's going to happen for a while now. It's going to last through at least the middle of the week. About a foot of rain expected in some spots. And the chance of 40-mile-an-hour winds is adding to concern about flooding from rivers that could overflow nearby. All of this could mean mudslides, with some already reported in Northern California. One big highway there is partially shut down. In the mountains, a new avalanche risk. I want to get right to meteorologist Bill Karens. It is dangerous, potentially, uh, potentially risky weather that's happening when you combine the rain, the mudslide risk, the avalanches, etc. Is this a function of El Nino? Uh, it has some uh, footprints of it, uh, fingerprints of it. I mean, you, you'd be looking, you know, if El Nino would be a lot of warm storms with a lot of rainfall, um, with impactful winds too. This one has uh, most of those ingredients, and we're not seeing a lot of snow. It's a very warm storm. So we had the atmospheric river this weekend. Now we're dealing with this huge storm in the Gulf of Alaska, and this is what's going to plume. This plume of white, that's all moisture in the clouds. That has a lot of rain with it, and that's what's going to come in tonight and kind of be with us lingering until like Wednesday. So the green on the map is light rain where you see the yellow and reds. That's where the heavy rain is right now. That's right over the top of the Olympics. That is the bullseye. That's the area we are most concerned with for significant river flooding in the next 24 to 48 hours. Water could get high enough to get into some towns, possibly major flood stage. So that's the biggest concern. We'll also see isolated effects uh, anywhere in the Cascades. We've got the runoff from the snow that's melting. And then we also have the heavy rain, too. And of course, we mentioned the avalanche threat. So there's the 9 million people at risk of the flash flooding. It does not go into California. It's the Oregon coastline, Washington, and a little spot here near Spokane in northern Idaho. Most rain at the Olympics.
8 to 11 inches in the next couple of days at the high elevations of the Cascades, up to 6 to 9 inches. Snow levels are so high. They're like 9,000 feet. So even the people driving through the passes, uh, likely you're going to be okay. And you were mentioning the El Nino and where we're sitting. Right now, we just got the new update today, Hallie. 1.8. So all this should mean to you is that once we get to 2.0, that is what we call a super El Nino. We've only had a couple of those, and those are the ones where we have the most extreme weather conditions, especially on the West Coast. And right now, we're here. And I think next month we're probably going to go and start classifying this as a super El Nino. And Hallie, one last climate headline for you. Please. We just learned from two different agencies that November was by far the warmest November our planet has ever experienced. Wasn't October the warmest October? Yep, and before that, and we September did it in was September. the warmest September? Yes, and August before that, and July before that. Quite the trend. Bill Karen's yeah. uh, lots to unravel there. Thank you very much. We'll talk yeah. more, I know, in the days to come about all of it. Appreciate it. But first, we've got to get you back out west because in the last few minutes, just in the last couple of minutes, we've learned a suspected serial killer is now facing murder charges for allegedly shooting and killing three people experiencing homelessness and one other person as well. We're expecting that suspect, 33-year-old Jared Powell, to be in court any moment now. Remember, we brought you his breaking news right here Friday that police were asking people in the area not to sleep alone outside as they were looking for this killer. Now they think they've caught him, connecting him to all the murders, they say, all within four days throughout L.A. County last week. You see some of the locations here. Dana Griffin is covering all the latest developments for us. And now we have these new charges, Dana. How did we get here and where does this go? I got you now. We're back. We're back. Yep. It sounds like oh, wait, Dana's having a couple of, is okay. having some tech issues. I think she might be able to hear us. Um, we will get back to her any minute because, as we say, this is all developing in just the last couple of minutes here. Remember, it is now 620 East Coast. It is three hours earlier out West, which means it is still the regular course of business for the court system out there. I think we have Dana back as we're talking, Dana, about these murder charges now. Talk us through where this goes. Yeah, so Hallie, we are expected to see Jared Powell in court sometime this afternoon. It really highlights how important investigators want to to show the, the severity of this case. This isn't just someone who's accused of being a mass murderer for allegedly killing four people. This is someone that they said in their press conference is a suspected serial killer who targeted four men in a short span of time, four days, and deliberately killed them. Uh, investigators say part of what helped them catch this guy was an automated license plate reader. They entered the suspect's vehicle, uh, his license plate number, into that system. And once he crossed into Beverly Hills on Thursday, investigators say that alerted police and they were able to make a quick arrest. Now, some civil civil liberty groups have opposed this technology, citing privacy concerns and fears that the technology could be abused and used for political spying. Well, Beverly Hills police say that that's not what they're doing with this technology. They are focused on catching criminals, and they say this has actually helped build trust within the community because instead of stopping several vehicles that match a suspect's vehicle description, they can pinpoint a specific vehicle. Listen. I think what the technology does, instead of stopping a lot of vehicles that might have someone that matches the description, what it does is allow us to stop the right person in the right vehicle. And uh, again, I call that precision policing. So Powell faces four counts of murder. He also faces some special circumstances in this case. If convicted, he faces up to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Hallie, this this is also an instance um, of a demonstration of the vulnerability of people who are experiencing homelessness here. Talk about the pressure on the city to help on that issue, which is an issue that they've been struggling with um, for, for years now. Yeah, and I think that's the key here. This is something that has been going on for decades. I spoke with homeless advocates on Saturday. We were down on Skid Row and they say, there is no quick solution here. They really want elected officials to take responsibility and to solve the issue. But how do you do that? There are so many homeless people, 46, an estimated 46,000 in Los Angeles alone. And there's just not a simple answer. But a lot of people are now, you know, asking for more to be done so that this vulnerable population isn't targeted. Hallie. Dana Griffin live for us there in L.A. Thank you. To Washington now, the Supreme Court. And justices seeming split over a controversial settlement that puts billions of dollars on the line for victims of the opioid crisis. Down 
You're seeing a handful of protesters there outside court today. They were chanting, strike down the deal. That's a reference to the settlement between Purdue Pharma, its owners, the Sackler family, and victims of the opioid crisis. It's a settlement the Biden administration is now arguing against since it lets the Sacklers avoid any future lawsuits related to that academic, epidemic. rather. For some victims, it's a moment marking the most high-profile and most highly charged fight yet in a battle for accountability. For Ellen Isaacs... He was a remarkable young man. The grief still raw after her son, Ryan, overdosed and died in her home in 2018 after struggling 17 years with addiction. I hear this huge bang on the bathroom wall, and I finally got it unlocked, and he was there on the floor, blue and foaming at the mouth. Isaac says Ryan got hooked on opioids after doctors prescribed him painkillers for a back injury. It's why she joined a lawsuit against Purdue Pharma, formerly owned by the Sackler family. But the terms of the settlement mean she wouldn't be able to sue on her own down the road. No one would, since the settlement releases the Sacklers from future liability. The Sacklers are just doing whatever they want to do, and we're stuck left and holding the bag. It's every mother's nightmare. And so for Purdue to come in and structure a way to uh, their owners to escape liability is just wrong. That's all she's asking for, to, to, to go before a jury of her peers and have a trial. Attorney Mike Quinn. Mistake. This is not over. In court so. today, after giving up corporate cases to devote more time fighting for victims of the opioid crisis, an epidemic estimated to have killed more than 600,000 Americans. This bankruptcy system was not set up for people to absolve themselves of wrongdoing and, and really bad activities. Under the Sackler family, Purdue manufactured OxyContin, the highly addictive opioid. The company's already pleaded guilty to multiple crimes related to misleading the public about the drug's potential for abuse. Hospitals, states, and individuals brought thousands of cases against Purdue, which this settlement, now on hold, would resolve. Its terms mean the Sacklers would be paying billions of dollars to victims and others in return for the release of liability. To some, it is enough. Lawyers for one group representing multiple plaintiffs writing in a brief, while their clients have no love lost for the Sacklers, they recognize the settlement is the only means of getting billions of dollars in life-changing and life-saving funds that are desperately needed today. Reps for the Sacklers did not respond to our request for comment, but lawyers for Purdue in court argued this money matters. Creditors and victims will be left with nothing, and lives literally will be lost. Nothing in the code commands that tragic result. I want to bring in now one of our Supreme Court correspondents, Lawrence Hurley, who is joining us here. You spent the morning, I know, at the Supreme Court following these arguments here that we've just laid out. It seems like if you're reading the tea leaves, the justices seemed pretty split with some questions over why they should blow up this deal. Since, as we noted, there are some plaintiffs who are in favor of they want the money. That's what Purdue's arguing. On the other hand, there's concern here that this releases the Sacklers of any other accountability down the road. So help us understand the arguments and where you think this may go. I'm not asking you to make predictions, but just the sense from your sort of expert knowledge of tea leaves here. It's a tough one for the justices because I think there's a sort of dry legal argument that's about, you know, what the power of bankruptcy judges and whether they can approve settlements that involve people who aren't directly involved in the bankruptcy, which is in this case is the Sacklers. Uh, and there, you know, the court, some of the justices at least seem pretty sympathetic to that argument. Mm. But then you have this bigger question of like, well, you're going to blow up this big settlement. The, most of the plaintiffs support it. It's a lot of money and they might not be able to get the money in any other way. And uh, some of that, those comments were sort of encapsulated by Justice Elena Kagan, who had some comments on both sides, which I think we can listen into now. It's overwhelming, the support for this deal, and among people who have no love for the Sacklers, among people who think that the Sacklers are pretty much the worst people on earth. In some ways, they're getting a, a better deal than the usual bankruptcy discharge because, as Justice Gorsuch uh, indicated, they're being protected from claims of fraud and claims of willful misconduct. And so, uh, yeah, what we can see there is that Justice Kagan, you know, on the one hand, she's saying, well, they're getting a sweet deal here. But on the other hand, she's saying, well, we need to protect this settlement to help the people who are suffering from the opioid epidemic. Does this seem like a case? And again, just so people are understand, we're not going to know which way the justices will go until probably the end of the term here, at least close to the end of the term in spring or early summer. Does this seem like a case that may split down sort of tr quote unquote, traditional party lines for these justices? No, I don't think so. I mean, the argument today suggested that, you know, 
they're, they're all kind of grappling with this. Yeah. You know, it wasn't really clear, like, if anyone was super one way or the other. Mm. It's more like they're all kind of weighing both sides. Yeah, but some of them, you know, just as Neil Gorsuch seemed very uh, supportive of the government position, but other people not so much. The stakes are huge here, Lawrence. Yeah, there's a lot of money at stake. That was a point made by Pratik Shah, who's one of the lawyers uh, for the victims. Uh, and we, we can hear a little bit of what he's had to say. Let me be crystal clear. Without the release, the plan will unravel, Chapter 7 liquidation will follow, and there will be no viable path to any victim recovery. And so what we can see from that is that, you know, if this settlement doesn't get approved, uh, the victims think they might not get anything. Yeah, uh, we will see how this one plays out. Lawrence Hurley, thank you very much uh, with a very high-profile day at the Supreme Court. Appreciate it. Coming up, a lot more to get to here on the show, including the new bizarre trend actor Florence Pugh probably is not happy to be a part of. Oof, do you see that? We got more on that later this hour. We are just learning the hack on 23andMe was a lot worse than initially thought. Originally, the company said hackers got access to the data of about 14,000 people. Turns out it was nearly 7 million customers, according to a company spokesperson. That's about half the number of people who use 23andMe. Let's bring in cybersecurity reporter Kevin Collier. Kevin, what happened here, right? Like, the number explode. 14,000 is not even a little bit close to 7 million people. Talk to us about how this happened and the data that's at risk here. This is people's most personal info. It is. So it's it's two factors here that, that, that is how they, they got this. Uh, step one, you know how we're not supposed to not reuse the same username and password across multiple sites. This is exactly why. Most users were not hacked. A couple were. Hackers got a list of usernames and passwords, a giant list from previous sites, and just spammed 23andMe until they got into a couple thousand users' accounts. And then from there, it's kind of 23andMe by design. They have a, something like a social media network. You know, the, the whole point is you're supposed to meet other people who have similar genetic match, maybe related. Uh, and so with that information, they're able to look at other users. You might have a hop or two away. So you, you can see their uh, kind of ethnic background. You can see specific DNA information. You can see their name, zip code, really, really personal stuff. It's kind of built into how 23andMe operates. So what's the company saying tonight? How are they going to rectify this? And what do people who use it need to do? Because I remember the time, I mean, like, people used to get that for Christmas presents, for family members, right? For holiday, it was like a huge thing. Everybody was like, oh, I wonder what, you know, what is, that this is all about. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things where it's, it's, it's fundamental to the company. Like, biometric information yeah. is, it can be a really handy thing. You can learn these, all this information about people you might be related to. It can be really... It can be great for security, too. But biometric, kind of by definition, with very rare exceptions, you can't change it. So if you give that information to somebody and they don't have take a lot of custody over it, it gets leaked, you don't get it back. That doesn't change. It's built into your body kind of forever. So it might make some people think twice about sharing that kind of information. Kevin Collier, thank you very much for that. Appreciate it. Let's take it down Pennsylvania Avenue now to the White House, where an official there is telling our team that senior administration officials have been actively engaging with congressional members over the last few days to try to get those lawmakers to approve tens of billions of dollars in new help for Ukraine. That says the White House is sending a warning to Congress today, earlier, saying the administration is out of money and almost out of time to get weapons and equipment to Ukraine, jeopardizing that country's ability to defend itself in the war against Russia unless Congress does something by the end of the year. Clock is ticking. We'll stay on top of that one. More on the show when we come back, including a race against time in Indonesia, how teams are trying to rescue dozens of people now stranded after a volcanic eruption. Then a new investigation just opening up on a deadly attack in Paris. Why officials there say the suspect could face terror-related charges. That's next. To Indonesia now, where a huge volcano has erupted for the second time in the last few days, setting off a desperate, desperate scramble to try to find survivors. Eleven people have been killed. A dozen more are still missing. And the mountain is still spewing ash on the villages below. Here's our Josh Letterman. A huge volcanic eruption in Indonesia stranded dozens of mountain climbers. And local officials say it killed at least 11 people. The sound of prayer as the search continues for 12 more missing people, according to officials. Efforts halted this morning when the mountain erupted again. 
But amid the smoke and ash, perhaps there's also hope. Three survivors brought down from the mountain today. One man reaching out for help from high altitude. Uh, he had sent a video of his condition and said that he was trapped. After that, around 6 p.m., he called and he said that he was very thirsty. He could not walk anymore. The agonizing wait continues for this woman, hoping for news about her nephew as rescue efforts resume. He left for the hike on Saturday. It looks like he was on his way down and got stuck until now, and we don't know his whereabouts. Mount Merapi is one of the country's many active volcanoes, located on the island of Sumatra. It's one of more than 120 active volcanoes in Indonesia, which sees so many because it's part of the Pacific's Ring of Fire, where shifting tectonic plates often trigger eruptions and earthquakes. The peak of Merapi has been close to climbing since 2011, but that hasn't stopped some from breaking the rules. When the volcano exploded in a plume of ash and smoke on Sunday, responders couldn't rescue everyone. They found 11 bodies this morning, but could only recover three before it erupted again. A local official saying they fear more eruptions. Around the base of the volcano, several villages woke up under a thick blanket of ash and volcanic debris, unsure if tomorrow will bring more survivors or more eruptions. Josh Letterman, NBC News. NBC News covers hundreds of other international stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our teams around the world have done it for you. Here's some of what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. Out of France, officials are investigating the stabbing death of a 23-year-old German Filipino tourist near the Eiffel Tower. The French president, Emmanuel Macron, calls it a terror attack. The suspect's in custody, and officials say he put up a video before the attack swearing allegiance to the Islamic State. Out of Brazil, take a look at this. This is Florence Pugh, and she's about to get smacked in the face by something that was tossed, oof, right in the nose, it looks like, tossed out of the crowd. This is at the Comic-Con that Brazil has while she was taking a picture on stage with the castmates from the Dune. She's only the latest celebrity to get hit by something thrown at them in this, like, bizarre and really messed up trend. Pugh's reps haven't responded to NBC's request for comment. And out of Antarctica, a British research ship just happened to cross paths with the biggest iceberg in the world. Look at that. It's three times the size of New York City. Scientists on the ship took samples of the water around the iceberg to help try to figure out what kind of life could maybe form around it. Pretty amazing. Coming up here on the show, Spotify tonight saying it's laying off a bunch of workers and the timing of this whole announcement is interesting. We're getting into why next. Tonight, new details after Spotify says it's slashing 17% of the people who work for it. They're laying off 1,500 people in what is the third round of cuts this year. The CEO, in a new email to staff, says Spotify took on too many employees. They overloaded in 2020 and 2021. Right around the time, it was making some big podcast deals with Joe Rogan, Meghan Markle, the Call Her Daddy podcast, which you probably listen to. A lot of people do. It's all coming right as we all got over our Spotify wrapped. Probably the biggest and most successful brand campaign that Spotify has. It's whole breakdown of what we all listened to in the last year. I want to bring in Jake Ward here. Um, A lot of people obviously use and listen to Spotify. We did a whole segment on the show the other week about what the wrapped meant for the industry and for the company generally. Are these layoffs enough to get them back on track financially? Considering if you look at Wall Street, they seem to like it. Well, that's right. I mean, the 30,000 foot view here, right, is, of course, the upending of the music industry, Hallie, right, where you've got artists making as little as they've ever made on recorded music, having to depend on touring to get around. And that's, of course, because of companies like Spotify. They come from this long tradition of pirated music, the BitTorrent world, right? All of that is where Daniel Ek, the CEO, comes from. It was sort of the business model of Spotify. So there's all of that. Uh, There are also some very specific things. So in spite of the user growth over time, which Spotify has enjoyed. I mean, in 2022, you had 456 million people using it. Uh, This year, it's gone up again, 574 million. You know, it's got 118 million more users now than it did last year. That's a big deal. But the problem is the margins on that business are incredibly low. Acquiring the license in order to legally stream this music is very, very expensive, which is part of why they don't want to pay artists very much. And it's why, you know, their, their profits are so low low. They've only just turned a profit this last quarter in a sort of surprise move. Mm. And here's the other big one is that they owe about a billion and a half dollars on a piece of debt that's coming due in 2026. And Daniel Ek points at the rising interest rates on servicing that debt. They've got a big, big mortgage to pay. And this seems to be a move to try and get out in front of that kind of debt, Hallie. 
As you take that 30,000 foot view though, right, talk through the way that we're seeing some of these tech companies making moves, um, trimming, trimming costs when they can, labor costs, using AI when they can. Um, what does that say about sort of the, the bigger moment that we're in here? Well, I think, you know, any company you have out there that builds its business proposition on technology is going to be trying to trim labor at some point. You know, one of the places that I always come back to when I think about this is Uber. If you look at their yearly filings that they have to put through with the Securities and Exchange Commission, where they have to tell you what some of the risks are, are for investing in Uber, they talk, for instance, about the push to wanting to replace human drivers with autonomous vehicles. And they say in the filing itself that they want to do that you know the the idea that we're going to use autonomous vehicles to substantially reduce our costs that's true at uber and trying to do that kind of thing at spotify or any other tech company is what's coming and so over and over again especially as times gets tight they're going to cut people first and that seems to be the move here hallie jake ward thank you very much for that breakdown a lot more to come here on the show you know that buying a house feels pretty impossible to a lot of people right now so what has to happen for that to change We've got a look in our ongoing American Dream series. Come out. So you know tonight that millions of Americans, maybe even you, are facing this dilemma. When, if ever, you're going to be able to buy a house. Because owning the home, to a lot of folks, is one of the main pillars of what we think of. When we think about the American Dream... But for so many people, it is simply not affordable these days. The average price of a home still sitting at more than $430,000. So renters are having a tough time jumping in. Even some who already own a house are feeling stuck with today's high mortgage rates. It's leading to an ice cold market with pending transactions, meaning sales to come at the lowest they've been in 20 years. Christine Romans has more in our American Dream series. <laughs> The housing market is frozen and expensive. Want to buy a house? You'll probably need to be making six figures. And that's just not something a lot of people in the U.S. have. It's hard even for those checking what would normally be the right boxes. An experienced 29-year-old Dylan Rose knows right. well. There is uh, no way that we came even close to being able to afford a house, despite us having good jobs, a combined $200,000 income recently married he and his wife planned to buy a home in beacon new york a few hours from new york city only to be priced out within just five minutes of of going on websites like zillow it just wasn't feasible at all recent data from the national association of realtors showing the salary of a typical home buyer is one hundred seven thousand dollars up 22 percent from last year but the thing is the median income for families is only about seventy five thousand so what's making buying a house so out of reach for a lot of people one big thing, high mortgage rates. Remember, for the last year and a half, the Federal Reserve has been raising interest rates to fight inflation by slowing down the economy. And for some people, that's exactly what's happening. Those rising rates can add hundreds of dollars more to a monthly mortgage payments, putting home ownership out of reach for a lot of people. For a starter home, a minimum of about $4,000 a month, plus the, the uh, down payment, close to $100,000 just for that. Today, the median American household needs almost half of its income to cover the cost of owning a home. That's the highest ever on record going back to 2006. And when you take a closer look at who ends up being able to do the buying in this market, it's older buyers. Repeat buyers who may be boomers are the ones who are winning out on today's housing market. They have the money and they're often sitting in homes already with mortgages paid off. The vast majority of younger homeowners with mortgages have interest rates well below 5%, which can make it hard to move. That leads to fewer homes on the market, keeping prices high. Existing home sales last month at a 13-year low. It all means that today, first-time buyers make up only 32% of the market, historically low, and they're more likely to be in their mid-30s rather than their late 20s like they were a few decades ago. They're substantially wealthier. And we also saw that this year's first-time home buyers are more likely to rely on financial assets. So 401k, stock, cryptocurrency for their down payment. And that's not something that every American has. A sobering reality for Dylan and his partner trying to build a foundation for the future. Unless you have generational wealth, it's very, very challenging right now.
Christine Romans is joining us now. It is so interesting, Christine. If you are not a boomer, if you're yeah. a millennial, if you're a Gen Z, is the only solve crossing your fingers and hoping that mortgage rates go down? <laughs> and you're hoping that, you know, time will heal all these wounds and eventually, sometime next year, things will get back to normal. But we're really far from normal. You've got high prices. You've got these high mortgage rates at 8%. Consider that 80% of people in a home right now, their mortgage is below 5%. So that 5%, 8%, that's a big difference. And low inventory. I mean, look how low, Hallie. 3.6 month supply. Mm. That is way uh, lower than normal. You usually have to have about a half a year to be considered balanced. What about people who are stuck renting right now? Is that really the worst thing? It seems like there might be some benefits to it. Well, I'm glad that you said that because for the first time in maybe a generation, it makes more sense to rent than to buy when you look at mm. how the budgets all come wow. out. So it might mean you just have to sit tight here and save your money. At some point, these boomers are not going to stay in these big houses that they have paid off forever. <laughs> They're going to downsize. They're going to move. And at some point, interest rates will start to drift lower again. The inflation story may be under control here, which means next year will be a year of maybe slightly declining interest rates. And so perhaps uh, things will get a little bit more normal. But I will say, when you look at the post-World War II history, 8% mortgage rates aren't really that unusual. But we had spent, what, 10 years at 0% uh, interest. So this is still the hangover from, from really cheap money for too long in this country. Christine Romans with our American Dream <laughs> series. Great to have you. Thank you nice so much. Nice to see you. You too. That does it for us for this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.